Welcome to a bonus episode of EV Rider. With me right now is one of the EV legends in the electric motorcycling community, Terry Hirschner out of California, but he's also into EVs of all types, not just motorcycles. And he just completed a cross country trip in the blazing heat in a 2022 Ford Transit electric vehicle and a first generation LEAF. And for those of you that don't know, the first generation LEAF, yeah, it's not the best vehicle to try to do a cross country tour. And, and Terry's here to attest to that. Terry, tell me about your tour across the United States from California to the Carolinas. Well, I, I knew it was going to be uh, quite an adventure, but the thing is, that's that's sort of the thing I kind of live for. I love it. I love a challenge. And uh, when we, uh, I bought the Leaf for $5,000 uh, a little over a year ago. And um, it was basically, uh, my mom had come out to visit. I hadn't seen my mom in five years. She lives in North Carolina. I live in California. And, um, you know, taking her around on the back of the zero. I, I mean, I've had just a zero for my only transportation for 10 years. And it's fine for me. I take my dog. I, I've even moved, helped people move on the back of my Zero. You just balance the weight evenly on the back seat and strap it down. But Yeah, and I um, want to tell folks just uh, that may not know it, uh, of course, your dog is named Charger. Uh, he's a really friendly husky. He's even got his own Instagram account. And so, guys, if you're not familiar with Charger, definitely check out Facebook. You'll find some fun videos, and he's just a fun dog, and he's also yeah, well she's got an Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, at yeah. uh, Electric Terry, that's her uh, her handles. But when when my mom came out, I I um she was out there for you know quite a while without any transportation. Santa Cruz is a very walkable community, but there was times where she wanted to go somewhere a little further. And so uh, we made the decision. I, I decided to buy just a, uh, literally the cheapest electric vehicle I could find. Just she wanted something that she could drive on her own when she wanted to go somewhere and not have to have me take her on the back of the motorcycle. So I found uh, a used 2014 Leaf with a fairly heavily degraded battery. And that's why it was so inexpensive. But the, uh, the range didn't really matter because uh, the vehicle wasn't going to be used that often. So we got it, uh, highway range. We drove it back from Tracy, California. Um, had to charge it three or four times because it only had like a, you know, when you're going highway speeds, it really only has like a 35 mile range. Um, but, uh, you know, we got it back and we, we decided that, hey, do you want to try to drive this thing across country? And we decided, yeah, let's try to do it. So, uh, so we did. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I already know from looking at your travels that uh, the battery on the Leaf was just a bear. It would overheat quite a bit in terms of charging, which basically meant no DC or very little DC fast charging, which uh, EV aficionados probably aren't surprised by, given that it did not have a thermal cooling system. Uh, but I do want to check because I think especially people that are looking at Fords are going to be very interested to know how your transit uh, performed in terms of DC fast charging and the heat. How did the transit itself handle the 100 plus temperatures? The transit did wonderfully. We, um, I actually did this, this trip with the LEAF and the transit. Mm -hmm. We started the day after July 4th, mm -hmm. uh, July 5th. Uh, we, I tried to get out of Santa Cruz before the fireworks went off because Charger hates them. But um, we scouted the trip out back in May. So I've already done, I've actually done three cross country trips in the transit already. And the transit can go cross country in four days, easy. Um, it has a liquid cooled battery. When you plug in the DC fast charger, you can hear what sounds like a, a washer fluid pump coming on and that's the transit pumping coolant through the batteries. So like no amount of heat's gonna hurt the transit. But the Leaf being one of the first generation batteries, just like the zero is, and uh, you know, uh, you know, the I think the the current Energicas and everything else, they're all uh, air cooled. And when you have an air cooled battery, uh, when heat buildup happens, it takes a long time for that heat to dissipate. So, 
like just uh, I'm sure your viewers are very familiar with Stephen Day's trip across country on his Energica and Scott Harkless and everybody else. If you do more than one or two fast charges with a air cooled battery, your your charging speed's going to go down from there quite a bit. Uh, yeah, where, although I, yeah, you're right, and certainly cross country. But I also want to say to viewers, uh, the longest day I've done on my Zero SRF is uh, 371 miles. Now I do not have the 12 kilowatt charger set up. I only have the six kilowatt charger set up. Right. But I will say in um, high 80s, low 90s, like maybe a high in 91, uh, over the course of 12 hours, I never saw it drop below its um, five, seven, five, eight charge speed. Right. Why, the reason I say five, seven, five, eight, as we know, there's a little bit of loss between the charger, um, right. you know, but yeah. So at least for what I would consider reasonable travel, not iron, but um, the zero definitely will maintain its advertised charging speed. And I will say my first zero, yes, I did have overheating problems in Florida sun if I was doing interstate travel, but I got to say this. Well, your, your first one was no a problem. Your first I, one was a 2014, right? That's correct. I had a 2014 SR and uh, anything above 90 degrees, I would say after about 20 miles of interstate riding, uh, you'd start to have thermal issues. But this one, no problem whatsoever. I've never run into a thermal issue with it. Yeah, zero's gotten a lot better, but it, the current, uh, the way they pop the batteries, it definitely isn't ready for um, multiple DC fast chargers. Lots of people want to see DC fast charging on a zero. And uh, trust me, they have the technology. They've, they've had it for years. They've, they have a CCS charging station behind the the building they've had since I think 2018 and they, they've got it, but they know that, uh, you know, people want CCS charging because they want to do multiple charges a day for long distance travel. And zero wants to keep the motorcycle as uh, inexpensive as possible. And they have this philosophy they call KISS. I'm not sure if it stands for keep it simple, stupid, or, or keep it simple uh, with a nicer word, but um, they, they try to have, like unlike a bike that has like a transmission and all these other things, they want to have as least stuff on the bike that can go wrong. So they have a belt for load maintenance. They've got a, you know, potted air cooled battery. The potted batteries never going to corrode. Um, but it just isn't really designed for, uh, for, for DC charging yet. And I know they're working on it. I'm not sure what they're going to do to the battery to make it be able to do that. I know the new generation 2022 has got an air cooled channel in the center center, but um, yeah. you know, get, getting back to the transit, the transit has no problem because, because it's got a water cooled battery, you know, in the middle of the heat, you can charge and it's, it's ready to go for the next fast charge again. You can yeah. I mean, I, I've also got a Ford uh, electric. I've got a Mustang Mach-E and uh, you know, I've taken it to Houston and uh, up to Delaware. And of course I'm here in Florida and it was 113 degrees for a high uh, when I was traveling up to Delaware and uh, it didn't uh, 113. Ding, yeah. And it didn't take a ding in the DC fast charging at all. Now I will say my, my hottest charge of the day uh, was level two, but that's just because we wanted to explore downtown Charlotte. But when yeah. I got back in the car, it was, uh, like I said, it was a toasty 113. Uh, so that, of course, isn't a test because uh, level two is not that fast. But I would say that it easily maintained between 98 and 150 um, for all charges. And of course, as you know, um, all the EVs ramp down pretty quickly from their peaks. Right. Um, even Tesla. So, uh, but listen, since you went there, uh, got to circle back a little bit to chart sure. to zero and CCS. Um, you know, I, I think we've got to see zero get on CCS because in my opinion, it, it's not even as much about charging speed as infrastructure. Uh, because what I'm seeing in my part of the country is more and more level two chargers that either aren't available because other EVs are occupying them or they're frankly broken. I mean, if you know as well as I do, and you know better than I do, that plug share is littered with reports of faulty level two chargers. Um, and you know, one of our friends, Scott Harkless is an electrical engineer. He's of the mind that despite what some other um, 
battery experts say. You could, in fact, do an AC-DC conversion, even with the batteries that you have. And so what I certainly hope we'll see Zero do is come up with some sort of conversion system, even if you're only charging at CCS at 12 kilowatts, so be it. At least it would open up that vast infrastructure that we currently don't have access right. to as okay. EV motorcyclists. You know, and um, Zero has certainly proved that its current voltage battery structure can handle 12, and we know that CCS can ramp down to 12. So what about that idea? Is that something, in your opinion, that is possible for Zero to get something out the door quicker? Right. I, uh, I know a little bit about some stuff and, um, so I don't, I don't want to say too much, but, uh, just if I was to hypothesize, I would yeah. say that zero knew a long time ago that the best, the best way to go with their current battery voltage, which lets them keep the lowest cost controllers, controllers around a hundred, 150 volts are much less expensive by, you know, order of magnitude of, you know, one to $2,000 cheaper than when you get in the three to four hundred dollar range, and Zero's very concerned with keeping the base price low. You know, they know people already complain about buying a Zero SRF or SRS at twenty thousand dollars. They'd like to see it lower. So, um, keeping the voltage around a hundred volts for uh, the battery not only keeps the cost low from a motor controller standpoint, and and I think in the future higher higher voltage motor controllers will come down in price, and I think they already are, but um. That, that's just one factor zero has. The second is um, the higher voltage you have in a battery pack, the higher chance you have of corrosion because voltage is basically potential difference. And now if you well insulate a battery pack like Ford and Nissan and everybody else does, like when you have a battery that actually sits underneath the vehicle and um, has multi, multiple layers of uh, sealing and everything else that's easier to do, uh, but when you're trying to inexpensively and lightweight, lightweight is the key. For a motorcycle, uh, you want to keep the weight low. Um, sealing it from, you know, water intrusion and, and corrosion is, is a hard issue. When you have something that's 350 volts or 400 volts, it's a lot easier to, uh, to, to get, you know, leakage, voltage leakage and get corrosion and battery discharge. You know, they want, they want you to be able to take your SRF and park it at, 60 percent uh battery state of charge and forget about it for four years in a storage unit come back and it still be close to 60 percent when you have a higher voltage on your battery pack it can discharge with leakage a lot easier and they're so, right uh, to, and they're right to think that way yeah you know, because let's face it i mean we're both fortunate to live in areas of the country where we get the motorcycle year round but but our friends that are in you know, Rust Belt states, they got to put those bikes away for four months and uh, let them sit. And sure, nobody's going to want to have to think about coming out, you know, every week or so to trickle charge their their battery or make sure it's okay. So I think Zero is right to do that. And what you yes, said sir. about cost, um, that is definitely an area Zero has got to be concerned about because as you well know, their two biggest competitors, Harley Davidson's Livewire brand and Italy's Energica brand, they're both to the point now where they more or less have undercut zero for equivalent motorcycles. If you think of the top of the line SRS versus the Livewire One or say the Eva Rebel, once you option that zero out with the largest batteries, cipher store upgrades and fastest charging, it's now more expensive than the other guys. Right, so, so I know just a little bit about that because, um, it, and, and you probably do too, if you, if you think back just four or five years ago, both the uh, Energica and Livewire were both advertised right around $30,000, if not a little more. And uh, both of them decided to lower their price a little to compete with zero. It doesn't mean the motorcycle can be manufactured for that amount, or maybe they can, but uh, they're definitely not making a lot of profit on it. But the thing is when you have a market that has a certain price point and a year a lot higher, you've got to meet that market price point. So zero was actually always lower. Uh, Energica had more higher end components and was a higher end brand. Uh, but they met the price point because they realized to sell motorcycles, they had to sell it for that. So, you know, I'm not on the board of directors of Energica. I don't know what's going on, but 
I'm sure they're trying to gain market share and market name, and they had to do that by lowering the price. Well, because both Energica and uh, the Livewire brand are getting an infusion of cash, so that's helping them, I'm sure, as well. And yep. not that we're privy to what Zero may may have investor-wise, but um, yeah, they've got a tough road at the moment for sure. And speaking of Zero. Uh, I want to let viewers know that we're going to be doing another episode with Terry uh, about his historic first run from Jacksonville Beach out to California. And the reason oh, we're going to okay. do that is because <laughs> the Jacksonville Beach Pier just recently had its grand reopening. Uh, for those that you don't know, unfortunately, it took a heavy hurricane hit several years back. And uh, Terry started quite a trend when he went across country. So guys, stay tuned. That's going to be coming as a regular episode in a few more weeks to evrider.tv. So you're definitely going to want to come back to that. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode of EV Rider. Terry, I can't thank you enough for going ahead and, you know, taking some time out of this cross country trip from your home in North Carolina, your family's place. That's much appreciated. Well, you're welcome, Bill.